Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Global Washington. We'll be starting in a few minutes as our attendees join us. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's joining us this morning. It looks like we're ready to get started. So I'm going to stop screen share and kick it over to our speakers to begin. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to the 2020 Goalmakers National Forum. This forum is hosted by Global Washington, and this is actually our 12th annual event, but our first virtual, and we're excited to expand our reach and our scope. Thank you all for being part of this. I'm Kristen Daly, the Executive Director of Global Washington based in Seattle. Global Washington is a network of 165 organizations working to improve lives in low and middle income countries. Our network is made up of NGOs, companies, foundations, and academic institutions. About two years ago, Global Washington embraced the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, as a frame to promote the work of our members. The 17 goals of the SDGs, ranging from no poverty to climate action to life on land, and they were adopted in 193 countries and really are intended to be achieved by the year 2030 our members quickly realized that the SDGs provide a roadmap to enhance their work and to find partners and to sharpen their data-driven approaches to advance the goals. And there really has been significant progress and momentum in most regions in the world. For example, in 2019, the extreme poverty rate globally fell below 8%, the lowest recorded in human history. But then COVID-19 hit with the global health crisis that caused economic turmoil and revealed the fraying of our social fabric. The pandemic has stalled and in many cases reversed the progress toward the SDGs. For those of us in the global development community, the pandemic also forced us to take a pause and evaluate how we do our work. In 2020, we also heard the calls for racial equality in the US. This really illuminated the systemic racism and harmful power dynamics that extend to the global development community. We are now experiencing a moment in history to restart and rebuild systems and solutions to get the SDGs back on track. And we should not build back to the status quo. We have the opportunity to transition to something better and address underlying inequalities. Today, we're here to convene and celebrate the goal makers in global development. Those of you who work every day to improve lives of people in low and middle income countries. I hope this forum inspires you to continue the work you do. And I hope you find insights that help redefine how your organization will transition in 2021 and beyond. Over the next two days, you will hear from top thought leaders in global development and I hope you will engage and contribute your own perspectives using the virtual event and networking platform. We also have an exhibit hall with over 20 organizations and companies with some really cool giveaways and raffles that you should check out, including free membership, consulting hour, hours, gifts made around the world, gift cards and discounts. You can also connect with other attendees through the app and community boards. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors for the 2020 forum. We're very proud and very excited to have our sponsors here today. To start, it's Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Microsoft, Seattle International Foundation, the Chandler Foundation, Linden International, Columbia Bank, Global Impact, and our media partner, DevX. Thank you all for your support. Now let's get started with our keynote speakers. 
First, you will hear from Zia Khan, who is the Senior Vice President for Innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation. His full bio can be found in your agenda, but I wanted to point out that Zia leads a team at Rockefeller who partnered with the Brookings Institution to create what's called 17 Rooms to convene and advance the SDGs. Recently, Global Washington used the 17 Rooms model to convene our own virtual roundtables. And many of you here today participated in these roundtables over the past two months. The cross-cutting themes you see in your breakout session are the result of these roundtables. I'm grateful to Zia and his team at Rockefeller and his partners at Brookings for their work to support the SDGs. And I can't wait to see what's in store for the future. With that, I'd like to welcome Zia Khan and turn it over to him for his remarks. Zia. Well, thank you, Kristen. It's a real pleasure to join you here. And I'm grateful to you and the Global Washington team for inviting me to share a few thoughts with this very important convening of leaders. I'm Zia Khan, I'm the Senior Vice President for Innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation. And Kristen, you provided the perfect introduction uh, for my remarks. Overall, what I'm hoping to share with this group is why I believe the SDGs are even more important now than they were before 2020's COVID-related crises. They still matter as a destination, but how we reach that destination has to factor in what we've learned this year. I'll propose there are four great transitions underway that we've learned about in our own 17 Rooms process that can serve as a guide for our collective efforts to realize the better long-term new normal that you referenced. Now, I don't need to tell this crowd about the importance of the SDGs. They remain the best global framework to guide actions across sectors and help align different leaders, institutions, and sectors in new partnerships for collective action. At my institution, at the Rockefeller Foundation, the SDGs help us position our work on the global agenda, and they help us surface collaboration opportunities with partners who have similar goals but complementary capabilities. As an example, our work on energy access links clearly to SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. And that helps us work with private energy operators, financial institutions, governments, and civil society so that we can all incorporate clean, distributed, reliable energy, often through innovative rural solar mini grid solutions to serve rural communities and integrate them into national energy plans. We really are seeking to end energy poverty. Similarly, our work in health links to SDG 3, around good health and well-being. As 100 years ago, we helped shape the field of public health, we're now trying to use data and tech to invigorate a new form of precision public health, harnessing the responses to COVID to not only address the near-term situation we have to fix there, but also build back better for the future so we don't have to face a pandemic like this again. And similarly for our work on food and work and economic opportunity and also innovation. The SDGs are just a great framework for different institutions who have different goals to find ways to work together. Now, three years ago, we partnered with the Brookings Institution to host the first 17 rooms. This was an experiment in collective action. On the eve of the UN General Assembly, back when we met in person, we wanted to take advantage of everyone being in New York City. We convened leaders in 17 different communities working on the SDGs under one roof, our offices, to identify in parallel and in concert high impact actions that could be taken over the next 12 to 18 months to improve SDG outcomes. In a week where people hardly needed one more meeting, we were taken aback by how much people enjoyed the sessions, how many connections were made, and how many good ideas emerged. Since that session, we held another the following year and a virtual version this past year. John MacArthur and his colleagues at Brookings partnered with me and my colleagues at Rockefeller to iterate and refine this process over time. It seems to work. We keep getting good, actionable ideas, and we see a community that is strengthening, reinforcing old ties and building new ones. Now, we think there's a few ingredients to 17 rooms that we believe make it quite impactful, and I know you've gone through your version as well. So first and foremost, we prioritize practical, pragmatic near-term actions. We ask ourselves the question, what can be done next year? Second, we go where participants have energy. The moderators of each of these rooms help shape and focus on where there is momentum to sharpen ideas and use the other participants in the room to help harness knowledge, networks, and other resources to convert those ideas into committed action. And the relationship building is also important. And third, we are constantly evolving and adapting. This year in particular helped us think about how we're going to convene virtually, but then it also helped us think about how to use virtual approaches and technology to expand from what we could do in person. 
Now, as we were ramping up the third version of 17 Rooms process a year ago, the version for 2020, COVID-19 hit. And many SDG advocates had planned for 2020 to be an opportunity to remind the world of its commitment for the coming decade. COVID upended everyone's agenda. Leaders and institutions were less worried about the next decade and were consumed by what to do in the next few weeks and months, including Rockbone, including Brookings. We even asked ourselves if the SDGs were gonna be relevant in 2020 with so many urgent and pressing needs. But we know that upheaval can yield new understanding and opportunity. Outdated or unjust norms can finally crumble when society has to let go of status quo to address unprecedented challenges. And we've seen solutions put on the table this year that would have been unthinkable before. So for example, the need for massive and urgent government intervention has drawn fresh attention to social safety nets and the possibility of dramatic policy enhancements. Tragic consequences of racial discrimination have catapulted awareness of systemic problems and triggered prospects for much needed social reforms. And rapid environmental improvements linked to economic shutdown have rekindled consciousness and helped people reimagine the possible as we see the profound interconnections between ecosystems, economies, and societies. The 17 Rooms team started to see how we could integrate near-term crisis response with medium-term recovery to achieve a longer-term reset. And we bet that we could harness the necessary attention and resources devoted to addressing COVID-19 and leverage it towards making longer term progress on the SDGs. Our framing question for this year's 17 room process was, in light of recent crises linked to COVID-19, systemic racism and other urgent challenges, what are the one to three actionable priorities over the coming 12 to 18 months, in other words, by the end of 2021, that address near term needs while also making a decisive contribution to protecting or advancing your goals 2030 results? What actions can members of your room take to advance these priorities? Now, the moderators and participants for each of the 17 rooms worked hard over the year and came together in a virtual version of 17 rooms or 17 Zooms as we called it on Sunday, September 20th. We had a great day. Lots of great and practical ideas emerged and that we'll be publishing soon. In the meantime, we were able to take a bird's eye view across all the rooms. Everyone knows the SDGs are interdependent. There's lots of good analytical top-down work drawing the connections based on ideas. But we were able to see what those connections might look like based on the bottom-up proposed tactical actions that were emerging from our 17 rooms process. And the results were some insights, largely shaped by our colleagues at Brookings, around four great transitions that were underway. These transitions are major trends that were revealed by COVID to which people are already directing energy, but to which we need to continue directing energy in order to achieve success. To borrow a metaphor from Steve Davis, one of our participants, these trends are strong undercurrents that influence the ways we see closer to the surface. We frame these transitions as statements identifying the perfectly good and conventional practices we are going from to the emerging and more impactful great practices that we are moving towards. And we summarize these four transitions as follows. Number one, towards justice for all, from tackling economic and social inequalities independently to recoupling economic and social progress for everyone. Number two, towards blue-green replenishment, from valuing natural capital at the margin to actively stewarding nature at scale. Number three, towards equitable technology infrastructure, moving from celebrating novel applications to building inclusive systems for innovation. And finally, number four, towards generational transition, we're moving from preparing young people for the future to partnering with next generation leadership today. If this interests you, I encourage you to get a copy of the report at a link that I hope the organizers will be able to post in the chat or make available to participants. To me, there couldn't be a better time to have a convening like what you're having over the next couple of days. While the recent and unfortunately predictable surge in COVID cases is happening, the vaccines so far provide light at the end of the tunnel of the health crisis. But we have to learn from the last global financial crisis of 2008-2009. We gave up too quickly after we escaped financial meltdown. And as a result, we overlooked several undercurrents and great transitions that were leading towards political polarization and economic equality. 
And as a result, the past 10 years, we've seen in some ways, particularly in inequality, things get worse. In the US, we've had an election, we have a new president. While there's lots to be optimistic about, there's also a risk that we view the past few years as an anomaly and simply return to past practices. We must craft new approaches that build on what COVID has revealed and the great transitions underway. My hope is that convenings like the one you're having these days will energize leaders to meet this moment with ingenuity and energy to reset, reimagine, and rebuild our broken systems to achieve a new status quo that improves the likelihood of realizing the SDGs in the remaining 10 years. This decade was dubbed the decade of delivery prior to 2020. With 2020's compounding crises, I feel that title is even more apt and even more important for us to deliver against. I'm very grateful to have been asked to share my thoughts with you this morning. And I'm very excited to hear soon from Blessing, who is one of the amazing leaders driving our 17 Rooms process. Thank you very much. Zia, thank you so much for those inspiring words and your work. Thanks for joining us here today. So our next speaker is Blessing Amakwu, and she is the head of the goalkeepers at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And again, you can view her full bio in the agenda in the forum app. But I wanted to call out one part of her bio. Blessing calls herself a women's equality evangelist and has dedicated much of her time and energy on goal number five of the SDGs around gender equality. In her current role, she covers all of the SDGs, but she still brings her passion for equality as fundamental to every goal. So as I mentioned, Blessing Leaves the Goalkeepers Initiative, and this was started by the Gates Foundation to be a catalyst for action toward the SDGs. The goalkeepers bring together leaders from around the world to take a stand on issues they care about and hold their governments accountable for progress. They also publish an annual uh, report that Blessing will tell us about later on. I'm honored to have Blessing here with us today. Blessing, why don't I turn it over to you for your remarks? Thank you so much, Kristen. It's such an honor to be a part of this conference. And as I mentioned to you in private, just a huge congratulations for all the work that has gone into organizing this remotely. I know that it's not a light lift. So earlier this year, I spent a few weeks with my sister in Duluth, Georgia. This was in the months of January and February, those glorious weeks when travel wasn't wrought with a dozen calculations and spending time with loved ones wasn't a known risk. In the final week before I returned home to New Jersey, I spoke to my sister's belly often and begged the child growing in it to make his grand entrance before I had to go home. We were safely around his due date. Every time I told this child to arrive, my sister spoke to her belly and told the child to stay until his father, who was in Nigeria for work, arrived. Smart kid, he listened to his mother. A few days after I left, I learned that my sister had gone into labor. I was excited and anxiously waited for a phone call or for text. My brother-in-law had promised that we would FaceTime during my sister's labor. But calls and texts to him and my mother were unread and unanswered, and I started to get really worried. The next morning, I would begin to learn all that had happened in that stretch of silence. Apparently, my sister had called the hospital when her contractions got closer, and the hospital told her to come in. When she got to the hospital, the monitor showed that her contractions were 90 seconds apart. She was in a lot of pain, as women who are in labor tend to be, and she told the nurses that she was in pain. But rather than give her a bed or an epidural, the nurses sent her home. Why? The nurses said she did not look like she was in pain. We can't see it in your face, they said. Come back when you feel the pain in your body, they said, and they discharged her. She was in so much pain she could barely walk. They tried to go to the car and she couldn't make it and so they stayed in the waiting room. She, her husband, my mother. Last year at our annual goalkeepers event, we hosted a session on bias. And during the session, Dr. Joya Creer Perry, a thought leader and activist working to eliminate racial disparities in American health systems, spoke about how black women are three times more likely than white women to die during and after childbirth in the US. One of the key reasons this happens, when black people say they are in pain, they are more likely to be dismissed, ignored, or sent home without treatment. I listened closely to Dr. Joya during that session. 
Little did I know how close to home her words would hit in just a few months. As my mother, who had come from Nigeria for the birth, narrated the story to me, she said, I wish we just had this baby in Nigeria. Now her statement would probably surprise the average Nigerian. You see, many Nigerians look forward to coming to countries like America to have their babies because of how broken Nigeria's healthcare systems are. Nigeria has the second highest rate of maternal mortality in the world. Yet, many women are shocked to find that when they come to the US, the color of their skin becomes a barrier to accessing good health, regardless of their income and education. My sister had a brutal childbirth experience and suffered from complications, some of which she is still recovering from almost a year later. But thankfully, she and my nephew are alive and well. Now, why do I share this story? I think it says something about the artificial and colonial binaries of developed and developing worlds that we need to tear down. A woman's access to good maternal health in Nigeria, which is considered a developing country, is hindered by class. But a woman's access to good maternal health in America, which is considered a developed country, is hindered by race. In the end, the result is the same, women dying. This year, Goalkeeper's report highlights how people that are more likely to be impoverished due to COVID-19 are women. Across the African continent, this is because women work overwhelmingly in the informal sector, which tends to operate in now inaccessible spaces like people's homes and public markets. In America, this is because women disproportionately bear the burden of domestic and childcare work. Melinda Gates recently wrote a Washington Post article hiding a very staggering statistic. One in four women in America are considering downshifting their careers or leaving their jobs completely because of the pandemic. Here's the thing, the causes of inequity differ in different countries and cities. The impact and the impacted may look different too, but in the end, inequity is inequity. When I spoke to Kristen about what she wanted me to talk about today, she said, how do we disrupt and decolonize development? Now, I do not claim expertise on this topic. Indeed, it's the stuff of PhDs. But here is one step. We can change our lens for development. We can tear down these false binaries of developed and developing worlds. And the Sustainable Development Goals give us a fantastic way to do that. The SDGs organize us around shared global goals and give indicators for all countries. I am excited about the work that Global Washington is doing to engage around the SDGs in cities right here in America. For each of the SDGs, for each topic that is discussed during this summit this week, my challenge to you is to ask yourself, how is this local? How is it happening around me? And how is this global? How can I connect with those beyond me? To disrupt and decolonize development, we must grapple with power. It's one thing to highlight the stories of people of color in your report. It's another to invite a person of color to co-author that report with you. It's one thing to provide grants that empower local communities. It's another to ensure that people from those communities decide who gets the grant. It's one thing to invite young people to speak at your conference. It's another to invite them to curate that conference and to pay them to do it. Decolonization is about shifting from a model of empowerment to a model of power sharing. We should also grapple with privilege. If you're watching this speech right now, it means that you have at least one form of privilege. You have access to the internet. We all have privilege. And privilege isn't something to be ashamed of. It's something to spend. Zia spoke a few minutes ago about the 17 Rooms Initiative hosted by Rockefeller and Brookings. Last year, I got to attend 17 Rooms for the first time. I was part of room five for gender equality. And during our discussions in that room, I mentioned the need for intergenerational leadership in gender equality spaces. Michelle Nunn, a white woman, the CEO of a global NGO called CARE, and I believe one of the organizers of this conference, was the moderator for that room. That day, she asked me to co-share our learnings from the room. And the next year, she invited me to co-lead room five with her. To me, that is what spending privilege looks like. Amongst many privileges, I have the privilege of an education, the privilege of two passports, the knowledge of moving between dualized worlds. And these days I'm contending with the power and privilege that comes with having two words attached to my name, Gates Foundation. Every day I ask myself, how can I use my seat at the table? How can I use my access? How can I use my influence? Privilege and power can be uncomfortable to talk about. These things are even more uncomfortable to relinquish. But this is where the real work starts. 
disruption happens in the place of discomfort. This year, the world has undeniably shifted between Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, and SARS and Nigeria and much more. I felt a range of emotions, anger, disappointment, disillusionment, ennui, excitement, exhaustion, gratitude, hope, restlessness. Perhaps you have felt some or all of these emotions. I found and I am finding that the most important key is to use all of these emotions, including discomfort, use them as fuel to keep doing this work. And what a privilege it is to get to do this work. In closing, I'll share a quote that has nourished me greatly. It's an excerpt from the essay, Now Here We Go Again, by Kiese Makeba Lehman, and was published in Vanity Fair last month. Our hearts often do turn to stone. This arduous acceptance is a radical pleasure, a sad but sensuous reminder that we are worthy of looking forward to responsibly feeling good in a world of ruin. When the rain washes us clean, we will know. We will feel so good, I believe that. If we find, however, that the rain has actually left more bruises, soaked us in more sour than we ever imagined, and if that bruised sour feels so good, it is then that the pleasurable work actually begins. Many of our hearts are stone. Much of the beauty here has been sacrificed, but there is responsible pleasure to be found in the wreckage, in the pathways of the wrecked, and in all the goodness beyond what we've been allowed to discover. I truly believe that there is so much goodness to discover in the development sector, even in the pathway of COVID-19's wreckage. And I hope that during this conference, you will uncover some of it. Thank you. And Kristen, back to you. Blessing, thank you so much for those remarks. It was the perfect framing for the rest of the forum. Um, thank you all for joining this morning. And your Heidi, our producer, will give you instructions on how to get to our next session for the breakouts. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers and Kristen for sharing your expertise with us today. Coming up next are three breakout sessions to choose from. In your Whova app, click on agenda on the far left side to access what those sessions are and select the session you'd like to attend to be connected. Please also visit the exhibit hall between sessions today. There's a lot of terrific information there. And your Whova app is also going to have a poll for you that we'd love for you to answer about Global Washington and the conference. Thanks so much. Have a great day.